Uh, and like I said, Thomas, a, a few of the slides you and Chad, they're the same from the field day. Um, but I think Johnny, we talked about it out in your field one day. How long have you been growing it? Oh, I don't know. Several years. A long time, I guess. Really. A long time. That's a good one. Um, I like that. Just a long time. So, I know at one time, we had a lot in McLean County. Uh, and then all of a sudden, I guess the market, the price dropped, and there wasn't interest in it. So, like more prices came You saw the insurance come along so big, people get insurance on corn, you know. You couldn't get sort of insurance in this county until just the last year or two. Yes, and that's what we're going to talk about that, too. Um, so, with all the good things that were happening with corn and soybeans, grain started just kind of fell off the face of the plant for a little while. Um, but now, they're finding more and more uses for it all the time. It's starting to gain popularity. The market's growing. Um, I mean, with animal feeds and breads and cakes and all that good stuff, um, alcoholic beverages now, they're starting to be able to make a whiskey from it, or a bourbon, whiskey, whichever. Um, I know there's I know there's a company in St. Louis that is. There's another one maybe North or South Carolina. So they're starting to gain some momentum in that industry as well. Um, well, Kentucky is one of our distillers that we picked up on it. It would be nice if they did. So we had a market, a big market here close. Um, and also a lot of the a lot of people have that celiac disease that have the gluten. Oh, you want to uh, you should be uh, people that have the celiac disease and that gluten allergy. They can eat foods with grain syrup in it. So that's a, they're starting to do a lot more with food, uh, more commercial food, with grain syrup now as well. So that's another reason that the demand is starting to rise for grain syrup. Because it's gluten free. Yes. Yep. Uh, <coughs> Once upon a time, you know, Gray's Urban was, was first grown here in Kentucky in the 20s and was most commonly used for animal feed. Like I said, they're finding new uses for it with food for people with a gluten uh, allergy and now with the uh, bourbon whiskeys. So it's it's coming on pretty strong. Uh, the the yellow line that you guys see that are kind of in the middle, that right there is the national yields. Um, through about 2010, I believe. Uh, the blue, what is that? The blue line is Kentucky acreage. Like I said, uh, we had seen some a lot. We had a lot of it uh, in the 70s, 80s, and then it just all of a sudden dropped off. And then that red line that you guys see, it's higher than the rest of them, those are the yields in Kentucky. Um, which tend to be higher than the national average. Yay. Yes. Um, so it grows really good here. As far as production in McLean County in 2014, we had almost 900 acres of it. Last year we had almost 1,600 acres. And those were straight from the FSA office. Those are the acres that they gave me. It does really well on our soil types here, especially by the river with our Carnax McGeary's, um, the Melvins, the Wellstons, and the Wellstons, that's up with you all. And that's a beach grove from there. Um, so that's why we see it in a lot of our bottom ground. Uh, I know, I think, John, you may have been one to tell me a story that maybe 2012 drought, when you had to build a grain circle next to the field of corn, this corn was making 25, 30 bushels, and you guys were over on there. So, it does really well in poor conditions. Um, I'm, I'm almost certain you kind of grow a driveway and get a pretty good stand of it. I believe it come up in the driveway. Yes. Well, how much it might, but. Do too. Uh, last year, uh, throughout the county, we averaged about one, 120 bushels to 200. I know that's a big swing, but I never did see anything below that. There. I'm not saying there wasn't. Then all the yield checks that I did, um, with our grain sorghum study, it was never below 120. I don't know how to say the same about corn last year, unfortunately. So, um, I think our county uh, winning entry was 193 bushels. And after we measured that, I left 
he immediately called me, like, I just hit 200 bushels. The monitor's saying above 200, you left too soon. So, uh, and that was on the field ground, too. I'm impressed. It can be insured in McLean County now. Like Chad mentioned earlier, that's just come around the past few years, and it's through a written agreement. I know that Ohio Valley Insurance will do that. I'm sure the others will. I just had Josh's number handy the other day, so I called him to make sure that we can do that. Uh, our biggest issue here, as you guys know, is the market. Not the, uh, I guess, the global market, but as far as hauling it to the markets. We've got Gavilon and Henderson. Um, and that's it. <laughs> Last summer, well, this past summer, I was at Gavilon in Owensboro and talked to, to their main guy. He said, if we could promise them a, a barge room, they'll start thinking. All they need is one barge. Now, how many bushels? I haven't got that number from them yet, but if they get one barge load, they'll start taking it. Yeah. What is that? That that'd be a virus call well, you get a minute to take it in later on. They're not gonna tie up a, a, a barge and all in the fall I mean, it's probably gonna work quite when they want everybody to you know pull it some of that day and yeah. take it that day and, it. and if you're a one of course you can call it for like that. No. You right. know, and then if you are done, then you give it give it away a lot of your premium. Mm -hmm. uh, um, that's um the the Granary in Madisonville is opening back up and they are the rumor that they're going to start getting grain service as well. So, uh, which would probably help you all, not so much you guys in Beach Grove, but those in the Sacramento area. They can get there year up in that time you're in where you get on a lot of Right. Um, I talked to at Ag Expo to for Wednesday in Owensboro. The broker from Owensboro or from Arkansas and one of the main guys at the Tyson feed mill was there and they were trying to talk to all the local ag agents, which took another conversation was safe for after this one, but I asked them about Grand Sargon and they assured me that they would talk to their nutritional people, their analysts. See what we can do about getting into chicken feed. So they realize that cost-wise, you know, it's not most, it's not as efficient as corn, but it, it, it is higher protein than corn. Now I know. Um, but not, I mean, I don't know if they add lysine or, or the amino acids to yeah, it. Yeah. Or corn or not, but I mean, maybe that's where the uh, uh, also of it. I so, thought if you could keep corn and feed the corn, okay, there you the go. Corn it's and then you're using a hog, that's what we're doing. But corn is so well, I, 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 I would, for the simple reason that corn is a whole lot easier to grind. Mm -hmm. And I'm assuming that grass article is a lot like wheat, and I hated feeding wheat with a passion because, for one thing, it was hard to get every kernel of wheat. Bust it open, and if you did bust it open, mm -hmm. it would go through the hot water. It turned into powder, and it made all the solids and all the bits and was then spoke to the top in the summertime, and just it, it almost looked like you could walk across it. Yeah. Uh, you know, and, and then when you get to Holland, you know, you, you know, all that stuff had to be busted up, agitated, and, and uh, it, 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 it created a, a lot, a whole host of problems that I. The corn. I'd rather, I'd rather sell the wheat and take the money to buy corn. <laughs> um, go back to that market. Um, part of that last year, I haven't grown any grain sorghum in three or four years, but and, and, and the biggest reason I quit was the cost of the market. And Gavin wanted to quit buying it, and I had to haul it off to Henderson. I felt like Paul was soon doing me down there. So he's the only guy in town. Other than Mount Vernon, you know, if I wanted to double up on my lunch and drive to Evansville, but on my DTN screen at home, on the local market page, where you get all the local markets, they're listed in the closest to my house. And there's about 20 of them. So I took off Pembroke down the bottom, which I'm never going to go to, and put it back to Rouge, Louisiana on there. I used to have New Orleans, but after Hurricane Katrina, I, I don't guess they, they don't load corn <coughs> or grain out in. You have to go up 
the Mississippi Bar, not the Baton Rouge, the low grain. Last year, Milo, even though they were offering a premium, they were still a dollar fifty, dollar seventy five over corn in Baton Rouge, and they were just the, the elevators that were that were really paying premium for last year were making a fortune because they they had big margin. Yeah. Well, this, um, and I've got some slides on prices and the economics behind it. We'll, we'll get to it in a little bit. You know, last year, Milo prices stayed above yellow corn prices. This year, I, I don't know, I speculate to be about the same because we had such a good year with Milo. Not just here, but everywhere. Like all the southern states had. Have y'all been keeping up every grapes or things in the cones? Yes. Right. They claim it's uh, the Chinese market that put such a tariff on it mm -hmm. that, uh, that it shut it down. Last year they were buying coal oil and then they went to taxing and stopped. That, they stopped. Uh, but they, they taxed corn so high that farming was a better choice. But that was the reason they were. Well, then they turned around and, and taxed it the same. Yeah. And so they there, shut it down. Uh, there was an article on AgWeb that is actually, I just got the link to it on Twitter yesterday, that was talking about how grain sarpum was a good choice for this growing season because of market trends. New crop model is higher than crop corn. It is. Yeah. So I can't get nothing on my, on my screen. Did you get that information I guess on the elevator? No, it's on the... It's on the ag wheel through that great Henson. I don't know. Well, that's what my DTN, I, I, I never can get the Milo prices. I don't know why. I must have done something wrong and screwed it up when I was setting it up. So I just called the elevator anymore just to get price, the cash price that day on it. So, uh, the cultural practices or the agronomics of it. Like I've already touched, I can be good by a variety of soils. It just tends to do really well, or a lot of times better than corn on our poorer soils here. Um, it can be more profitable than corn, of course, depending on market price, but because of the fewer inputs. Um, when selecting a hybrid, and I've, I've got a slide on hybrids as well, there has not been any hybrid research done in Kentucky. Curtis and Vicki and I are going to change that. So that's one thing that we do want to add this year to our grain sarcom study. Um, but I have a uh, hybrid study from LSU that I'm going to show you all here in just a little bit. Um, but whenever you're looking at the varieties, you want to consider, of course, the yield maturity, stalk strength, disease resistance, and now um, sugarcane acre resistance. The, the head type is also something you want to consider. Um, you know, it can vary a lot. They have the open, the compact, the semi-compact. The semi-compact and open heads, they, you tend to have worse problems with those than you would the compact heads. Uh, Planting-wise, once that sole hits 60, 65, you're good to go. Uh, you've got a, a good window there between the 1st of May and the 1st of June, so you corn out and you put your put your mile all out unless it's last year then first of july we're still scrambling to get all the corn out so <clears throat> typically uh, it is grown in 15 inch rows here in kentucky you have a decreased chances of lodging when you do that um, planting death rate you know, from three quarters of an inch to, to an inch and a quarter Plant any deeper than that inch and a quarter, you're going to have a bad problem with emergence. Uh, so make sure you have good, adequate soil to seed contact. Uh, so that way, too, just like corn beans, you, know, you have a uniform stand when that stuff starts to emerge. Seeding rates. This one I, I found to be quite interesting. Your, our grain sorghum has grown fresh oil from Kentucky down, and that's it. Uh, it ranges anywhere from 4,000 to 120,000. It's 
quite quite the range there. Uh, whereas corn, you know, typically you're what thirty to forty thousand, and it's pretty standard, but it's all over the place with grain sorghum. In Kentucky, though, uh, the University of does recommend a sixty thousand seed and grain. So almost right smack in the middle there. Um, two high populations, of course. You're going to face issues with lodging or reduced yield, then too low, and you get to fight the weeds. Any questions so far? No. I think that on that slide, probably the most important thing is seed, right? Uh, it, it's more forgiving than the corn. Mm -hmm. it's, it's more like wheat. If you have a local population, it'll till it, and you might want to have four heads. One 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 stop. Yeah. Or you know, like it's just like we did till we're out and like but the only problem we run into then is head height. Some of them may not get up as high as yeah. the main main point mm -hmm. where you have to cut more stuff. Chad just made a good comment about grains are on there. It's more forgiving than corn. A lot more. Um, the growth stages, and this was a part that when I started looking into this, it was kind of confusing because with corn and beans there and wheat, it's pretty much the standard growth rate chart for everything across the board. Everybody uses the same. With grain sorghum, there's three, at least three different growth charts. This one right here that I have on there, this is the one that uh, that Pioneer uses. There's another one that I have on here. This one has nine stages. I have another one that goes through 11 stages. And then there's one mentioned in this production handbook that there's three stages, and that's it. So uh, which one do you go by? That's up to you. But what the key thing there is that whatever you do choose on growth stages, you want to make sure that your chemicals that you use, your pesticides, your herbicides, that you're on the same page as they are. Because if you use the Pioneer or Zero to Nine, and your, let's say your Savando or Preaxor goes on the one to three, you can be messed up quite a bit. So just make sure that uh, whatever you're using, that you know that growth chart that they're using, the growth stages, uh, so that you don't apply things at the wrong time. I said that that blew my mind when I got to look at grain sorghum and realized there were so many different scales. That uh, like I said, this is the pioneer of the zero to nine. This I know you can't see this, um, but this is the one that is zero to eleven stages. That's why it's amazing. <laughs> I like this zero to three quite a bit. Uh, it's a lot easier to understand, but this one it is it is a lot more descriptive. But my goodness, it's about like home on the growth stage right there. Um, our grain sorghum study that we did this past year, Curtis Dane at uh, Hopkins County and Vicki Shagger from Webster County and I teamed up and we started doing a grain sorghum study because we feel like it is starting to gain a lot more popularity. Grain sorghum study <coughs> came back. Uh, we had a lot of questions about it. You know, here in McLean County, we always have guys that enter the national contest. And 2014 was my first time ever being at a grain sorghum field. And I always had to call up other people, you know, our specialists to try to get answers. And so that that right there did me. I was like, I can't take this not knowing very much about grain sorghum. Uh, and Vicki and Curtis were in the same boat, so we wanted to team together um, and do some research of our own on it because there's not any done in Kentucky. There's not any variety trials. And this grain sorghum production handbook that the United uh, Sorghum Checkoff Program put out, they don't care one bit to tell you that there's no research in Kentucky. They're very polite about that. But they did have some input from Kentucky on this. Um, so we're hoping to get some of that changed. The last time some research was done, it was done on nitrogen, nitrogen rates, it was in like 2002. So it's been a while. Uh, and Dr. Lloyd Murdoch did that a long time ago. Well, not 2002, that wasn't a whole lot. 
doesn't seem like that far ago, but it actually was. Um, so we did two different things this year. We did a fungicide efficiency study and nitrogen rates. The first one, we were testing the efficiency on fungicide. We used Preaxor. We had three different test sites, one in McLean, one in Webster, one in Hopkins. Um, the average this year, and of course I know this was the year of fungicide, but almost a nine bushel difference with treated versus untreated. So not too bad. You, you got your money's worth. And there were some spots, uh, I think on the Hopkins County trial, I think it ended up with 13 bushel swing on that one. The Webster County was, it was like seven something, and then the McLean County one was almost nine. So this one is the one that was most interesting. Uh, Dr. Murdoch's study, his rates, if you were to look in our uh, Ag, I think it's 110 or 101 book, a lot of nutrient management guide, 120 units of nitrogen is it's the highest recommendation that UK makes for grade hurdle. And so that's why we wanted to see how far that we could push it. So we did um, four race nitrogen, 100 units, 125, 150, 175. Replicated it four times on the field, again, McLean, Hopkins, and Webster, and ended up finding that 150 units was about your, that was the best bet. Um, unfortunately, we only got data from Webster and McLean because the Hopkins County plot, the, the wind got it. It had some lodging issues and then the wind blew a lot of it down. Thankfully, we flew the drone over before we started getting out there and harvesting the plot. Otherwise, we might have been some very unhappy campers. Um, but once we hit, got past 150 and hit that 175, we started seeing a lot of lodging issues there. Um, so we knew that that was way too much. Uh, and then, I, I'm still kind of baffled 125 produced less than 100. But as you guys can see, the 150 units was significantly different than the others. So um, I think on average, what we usually put about 200 units of hand down for form. Yeah. So right there, that's a pretty good money saver. If you get to put 50 less units of nitrogen down. For this crop versus corn. And we're going to repeat this study again this year because, like Johnny said earlier, what works one year might not necessarily work out the next year. Mother Nature has a way of, of playing that. Um, but we're anxious to replicate the study again this year with both nitrogen and doing the fungicide study. And then also, like I said, this year we're going to add the variety of trials in as well. So we're excited about doing variety of trials. It's never been done anymore. That's the fun part. The economics. Uh, this, the prices right here, and these were, these were from August, so I apologize that it has not been updated, but really it's not too far off of today's prices at all. The, if you guys can see that on the left hand side, these are our costs or our inputs. The middle column is grain sorghum, and then the right hand side is corn. And I'm going off the assumption that we're going to average 150 bushels for both crops, which really is not unrealistic from last year. Uh, the day that I called Gavlon, grain sorghum was 386, corn was 356. So there you can see your, uh, <coughs> your profit with your gross there. $579 on grain sorghum per uh, 150 bushels and, or per acre. And then $533 an acre off of corn. Okay, so that right there is how much money you're gonna make a gavel on. Then you start looking at your inputs. Grain sorghum seed is significantly cheaper per acre than corn. Uh, there's a $65 difference. So you're looking at $30 an acre to plant grain sorghum, $95 for corn. Nitrogen, again, I put 150 units of in for grain sorghum versus the 200 for corn. You know, about a $25 difference there per acre on nitrogen. And then 
it doesn't require quite as much potash and potassium, potash and potassium, or potash and potassium phosphate. Um, so your prices are a little bit lower there as well. Lime though, we have the same pH requirements. That's all the same. Herbicides, the same. And I think for this, um, I figured Roundup at 2,4-D and maybe Sharpen is the chemicals that I figured this price for. On fungicide, the difference there is we use Preaxor for grain cycle and headline for corn. And the Preaxor is, yeah, it costs more than headline does. Uh, we don't have a lot of choices on fungicide in grain sorghum. So that's, we, just, we use Preaxor, uh, you can use Preaxor, and Quilt, XL. Um, there may be a headline that you can use for grain sorghum, but don't quote me on that, I'm not sure. Um, and then one thing that's not up there is pesticide, or er, insecticides, which you all know that's more of an as-needed thing. You're not going to do that every year, so that's why I didn't put it up there. Um, but for grain sorghum, well, last year, some people did spray, we'll get to that in a minute, um, they sprayed Savanto. I'm not sure on the call. I think it's pretty costly, especially if it's on that as-needed basis. Um, machinery, looking at the same. Um, Crop insurance did the same, cash rent the same, which hopefully um, maybe one day that's going to start to come down, especially since commodity prices are taking such a dip. Your operating costs and other expenses um, put corn a little bit higher because grain sorghum we typically don't dry, whereas our corn we do. So your total variable cost of production per acre. $480 for grain sorghum, $590 for corn. Over $100 difference in production costs. Quite a bit. So your break even yield with those prices that I showed you all on grain sorghum, 124 bushels, and on corn, 166 bushels would be your break even. Um, the market value, if you did produce that 150 bushel an acre, grain sorghum has to be at 320 for you to break even, and corn has to be at 395. Uh, as of this morning, 395 can only happen at Tyson. So, <laughs> and then your break even cost um, to at, at a 150 is. 362 for grain sorghum and 435 for corn, or 437 for corn. So, according to these prices in August, you guys can see that grain sorghum was that's a lot better off. Yeah, but that's what the premium in price too. Yeah, but that I just had cash prices on there, so I didn't have didn't figure basis or anything like that. Um, <coughs> but According to these numbers, you're better off with it. One thing that's not on there, good morning. Uh, that's okay. One thing that's not figured in on this though uh, is the cost of trucking. And that's the one problem that I do need to add because you're going to have a little more expense in trucking with grain sorghum than you are with corn, obviously. And the way we grind it costs, because nine times out of ten, somebody drives a grain sort. Yes. Most of us don't do it on the farm, but we did take off when we take it in. Mm -hmm. it's well, and that was, don't very often drive. I think that was an, an afterthought for me. That was one of those things that this morning, you know, I'll, I was getting ready at thoughts so that I forgot to put that on my production with Clean County. I should have put something issues. You made it up for all 30 issues. years. My case, but two or three times it's a little dry or field lift or mm -hmm. Well and we know that it and you all know it can be done. Miss Penny got ran herself ragged right getting it done. But it can she moved. <laughs> <laughs> but it can be done. So uh, and in our field day, I think Dr. Stan McNeil, he talked a lot about storage. Um, and 
and methods to doing that and drawing it down so that you can store it and get the better price for it later on. Oh. Yes, exactly. Oh! It's the photo of the oh. Is that here now? I just read about that here two months ago. But I took this picture. Okay. Yes. Oh. <laughs> I, I took this it. picture. <laughs> yeah. Um, Everybody had some. Is it just on Milo? Did that get on home? It's just on Milo. This is, that's where it's the main issue is with Milo. Uh, this had not been an issue in Kentucky until this year. My good friend Ben Rudy, who's the ag agent at Fulton County, we got an email one day that Ben had found it in Fulton County and that we needed to start scouting. And it wasn't a week later I found it in McLean County. No, for people to pay it. people that raise some hay for hay? Will it, 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 it we're good, Yeah, we're going to talk a little bit about some of the crops that it will host on here in the same thing. Yeah, corn's not, it's not an issue. Um, we were extremely, extremely, extremely lucky in Kentucky when this hit because it hit, I hate to say, the right time, if there is the right time. But sugarcane aphids, they do the majority of their damage. Is the four root stage. Thank goodness we were all headed out when this hit. So, um, you know, it, it wasn't a necessary thing to spray. I know there were some people that did spray because these little critters leave a gum, like a sticky honeydew residue on the leaves. And if you want to, if you're trying to get through in a hurry, they're going to gum up the combine. And that was the biggest issue with the sugar cane aphids when they came here was mechanical issues. It didn't have anything to do with yield. It was all mechanical issues. These things spread like wildfire. I mean, we, Curtis and Mickey and I, like I said, as soon as we got word that they were in Kentucky, we were immediately out scouting our, our research plots. We were out scouting other fields. And it's one that they start up the edge. So you don't have to go out and look for them. If they're there, you're going to see them on the edges first. And you can literally go with the drive by. There was one field we found with the drone. <laughs> it wasn't that we just went in a couple of rows, real slow, got close with the drone, flew over, we could spot them with the drone. And then we walked out of the very just play around outside? Do pretty good? You get on quick enough? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Or, how do they travel? You know what you said? Part of the McLean County only reported 1,500 acres. It's not like it's a major solid stand mm -hmm. from one end to the other. How are they getting around since the acreage is just brad? That, I don't, I don't, that might be one of those publications. You know, you could understand if it was like, you know, a major crop from one end to the other or right. travel field to field. Uh, my guess, if I had to speculate, would be about when Palmer Pig we could water him. Those seeds are going to attach to you, to me, to our vehicles, to our grain trucks, to our food. <coughs> you think eggs can get attached to the seed? I just said that to the We will. Mm -hmm. You don't have to be with your grain. You can in or out of field with your grain. The egg, you want. Right. Yeah, so these little critters, um, like I said, that, I hate to admit that, that I did take that picture. Um, so it's more like that I got to pull off the internet. No, it wasn't. It actually wasn't anybody in here. So congratulations, you guys. Uh, but this actually, we went uh, the first time we went. We went on Monday to scout all of our research fields. First thing, and we found just a few here and there. And then we started looking at other fields, and it started off just literally find a few here and there. You can drive by real slow, and you'll see the leaves. We really shine with this honeydew that they left, and then you know, right there, you're like, oh crap, <laughs> sugar cane aphids. Did you try to close before you went by the Yes, don't worry. Right, you're tracking more, right? No, don't worry, because we were, when we come out of grain starving fields, we're like searching everywhere, making sure we don't have any of that stuff off. Um, we take, especially since we have poultry here, take my bio security and all that good stuff very seriously. So, you never know when you come in a little bar, you'll never spray everything. 
So, what would you think of? Hey, I've got the suits. I've got the suits. We're good. This is uh, how widespread they were last year. Now, McLean County is green. Yeah. We're on the eastern edge, huh? Yes, we are. So, we can thank Tennessee and Arkansas, um, Louisiana for all of it but it just traveled right up the Mississippi. Like I said, it hit Fulton County first. It went along and they got here. Uh, now, just because a, a county's not green doesn't mean they didn't have it. It just means that they didn't know what count it. Um, I was at another farm and the guy told me, like, you know, I've been really lucky. I haven't had any sugar cane eggs this year. I took about four sets of there you go. I was like, I need to be the bearer of bad news. But there's sugar cane aphids right there. So they're on the other side of the leaf, too. There might be another reason some people don't see them. But that shiny stuff, you'll see it right off the bat. There's your sudan crash, Dad. So, host for the sugar cane aphid. Sargon, Johnson grass, and Sudan. Um, Here. 
uh, all mycogen. So, I'll, like I said, I'll print this sheet out for you all and hopefully <coughs> it will be something that Vicki and Curtis and I can incorporate in our variety trials this year too. But, fingers crossed, hopefully sugar cane acre will not be an issue this year either, so we'll see. What really determines what years is going to be a problem? I mean, is there something that sparks it down south to get it going and put it? I, that I don't know. So. Or does uh, it even travel south to north? Or is it yes, south? no, it does. It travels south to north. About like southern rust, you know, south to north. Um, well, I mean, that's I, probably because of, it's just planted first down there. I mean, it's, you know, first. Well, I think that some of it has to do with humidity as well, because you know how nasty it is the further south you go. Um, and then this year we had such a wet spring, wet June, and then July hit. It got hot and dry super fast. Um, of well, same way with Southern Rose, too. We had just the perfect storm, I think, this year for all the seasons and insects to come up. But some best man, well, this kind of goes along with your question. Best man to practice, first and foremost, get the Johnson grass gone, which I know how much you all love their Johnson grass. <laughs> but Sheriff and Avis love Johnson grass. That was always one of the first places I knew to check, too, if I'd seen Johnson grass in there and you check the crates or them right there first. Um, if you have any other sorghum species, so if you got Sudan grass close to your grain sorghum field, you may want to get rid of that too. Um, any type of host. Consider planting the tol tolerant hybrids. Um, they have seed treatments for it, but like I said, with it being us being the last ones to get it, I don't think the seed treatment is going to be very effective. Um, Plant early. Said we were extremely lucky because all of our grain was headed out when they got here, so damage was very minimal. It was just more mechanical issues than anything. Scouting is extremely important. Like I said, as soon as we got word of the Kentucky, we were out in the fields checking it. Um, Trim as soon as you reach the threshold. If you're pre boot stage, it's extremely important. Like I said, it wasn't too much an issue here last year. Well, I'll wait that long and just see some of us like better be going and talk about they explode. They do. Now, it, well, that's one thing I did in that picture that I showed you earlier. We went out like on Monday. We found some here or there. We continued to scout for the next couple of weeks in those same spots in the fields. I mean, where we just found a couple that week. <clears throat> it didn't take no time for them just to grow and be multiply and be everywhere. Uh, make sure you use the recommended insecticide rate and volume of water. Like I said, we don't have a whole lot of choice. If I was going to pick between Savanto and Transform, our two choices would pick Savanto. Uh, avoid using pyrethroids that will damage the, the good insects that we need. So that might eat aphids like ladybugs. Ladybugs are like our best friends when it comes to aphid control. And also use insecticide as needed for harvest aid. I said that this year it was only used because of mechanical issues, just to make sure it didn't come up too much. Um, obviously you're gonna do that, you're gonna raise your head a little bit higher or as high as you high as you can and move a lot slower through the field, which I know is not what you want to hear <laughs> because you all are already pressed for time. By the time you're getting your mile low out. Any questions on sugar cane aphid? They're a dirty little dude, so. Um, now I've got some stuff, some publications for you all too on sugar cane aphid. The next little section here are common diseases that we have on sugar cane or on sugar, it sounds like on sugar cane aphid is now. Um, Common diseases that we face with grain sorghum. There's some there's sugar cane I'm probably get lots of good stuff for you. Uh, one of the main ones that we have is root rot. The 
that's always fun. And last year would have been a year for root rot. Uh, when you have extremely moist, moist soils in the springtime, you go to plant. Um, and the humidity is high, it's getting better. Little metal tear them up. So, um, pH is a big concern with that. Make sure you have your pH in your fields from 6 to 6.5, which you guys probably would, anyways. Um, let's see. Avoid, of course, I know you can't always avoid stressful environments, but high, high pop, plant populations and extremely moist soils is what's going to cause root rot. Like I said earlier, people go up to 120,000 on populations, but here it's recommended at 60,000. So that'll help out. Okay, what's recommended here? 60,000. All right, now I'm a really wrong one. Well, I, I, 115 points where I was head I was about 110. But well, I, but I, are you on, are y'all on 15 inch roads? Or, uh, yeah, that's what I was doing. John, he does 30s, doesn't he? Uh, there's been some dirty done. Yes. He does 30s because he comes back yes. inside dresses. John, you might have 30 points. You got it. And you get some together. Uh, I just bought it for 15. I'm going to go back to 30s. We've got, and I just went back to 30s. We've got a nice reading. I'm going to go back to 30s. We've got a nice reading. I'm going to go back to 30s. We've got a nice reading. I'm going to go back to 30s. We've got a nice reading. I'm going to go back to 30s. I guess it's a stupid question. And I've, I've asked this a few times. And, and I, I don't know about 60, but I, I, I thought we should. I need mean, to drop mine down to a 70 or 80 anyway, at least 80. But I've been playing at 15 rows, and if I, so let's just take the 60,000. Mm -hmm. Is that 30 inch rows or 15 inch rows? Or? That's in 15. 15 inch, yes. okay. If I go to 30, what should I play? Um, that's a good question. I was thinking, I mean, obviously, up in. Well, let's just say if I was playing 100 in 15 yeah. inch rows and I went to 30, what should I play? You know. 30 if you're at 15 now, you're going to increase your rocking more than 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 you're going to increase your rocking more um, it may be in there. It is all It may be in there. And if not, I tell you, Lance, I will. I'll make a call this afternoon and I'll find out for sure. I'll be back with you. So, um, let's see. Ooh. The maze door mosaic virus. Yay. Um, management with insecticide treatments. Do not control this, which, you know, I don't think insecticides would either. The best thing you can do to, to prevent this is make sure you eradicate Johnson grass from around your field. Johnson grass is probably our biggest problem, obviously, because it's host to so many um, pests with our grain circle. Any other perennial grassy weeds that you might have in or around your grain circle fields, get rid of, and that'll help eliminate this. Um, fungal leaf whites and spots. And see a lot of a lot of this in untreated fields this year, but again, it was the the year of fungicides. So um, again, you can <coughs> help this by spraying fungicide, using resistant hybrids, and also eliminating or controlling your grassy weeds in and around your fields. Uh, bacterial leaf white and spots and then fusarium head white are also two issues that we find in uh, grain sorghum. So a lot of this, uh, with bacterial leaf white and spots, you can help eliminate that with the seed that you buy. Uh, make sure you do have certified seed this is for resistant hybrids, which I hate that we don't have a lot of information on that in Kentucky, but other states do, and I think that's also in those production handbooks, uh, some other variety of stuff. Um, and Fusarium head white, then timely harvest at uh, proper grain moisture is important. And also the open heads. We talked about earlier the different head types. With the open head and the semi compact, you have less <coughs> issues if you would with the compact heads. Mm -hmm. 
charcoal rod. Some of these, I, I hate that I don't have pictures for all of these. But a charcoal rod, uh, again, tolerant hybrids, um, reduce drought stress when possible. I know that's not always possible, but they suggest on here irrigation, but I know we don't have a lot of that here. So uh, avoid soybeans, corn, and grain sorghum for two or more years if you have an outbreak of this. Isn't that nice? So I don't know what you're going to do for two years. That'd be a good spot for him right there for two years. I like that, uh, the, the charcoal rock, though. That goes real close specifically to varieties because I have one variety. Mm -hmm. And excessive plant populations too. Oh, that yeah. also makes <laughs> an issue. Yeah, you're done. <laughs> <laughs> came down here and cut um, five or six dogs and sent them off to the lab. And they come back, they had everything. And then charcoal rock was one of the big ones. But I, uh, one of the last years I had my own was a year Hurricane Ike. Mm -hmm. And the winds. And, uh, yeah, it went down back. Mm -hmm. So, um, yeah, nice and fair and ground for two years of the severe outbreak. Yeah. So we'll find you another crop, though, okay? I promise. We got a lot of good stuff coming down the line in alternative yeah, cash crops. We had a camp meeting yesterday, and we're going to have another one February 25th. So, it's a big interest in that. It's quite interesting. So, yes, I have. And I'm going to give you a visual plot, too. See what? Medicinal? <laughs> Chad, I'm recording this. <laughs> Staring at the stock robot. Oh, again, here we go with these resistant hybrids. Uh, excessive plant populations can also cause problems with this. And poor fertility, which I know is not always um, the easiest thing to do on the ground to plant grain sorghum. But uh, that's where your soil samples come in to play there. And then also some drought stress also <coughs> causes an issue for this one. So questions? I'll turn this out for you. How big or everybody else try to find your own? Inch. Inch. I'll try and do an inch inch and I'll pull it. I'm planning to find mine. I had a six inch ring on it. And I thought, well, it's all over. Gave some time. I just believe it came up and it did. If you see that dog, I don't know if I'm going to watch it. The biggest thing I've ever done is plant plant. Uh, plant plant. Plant your corn, plant your beans, wait for it to get good and warm. They, especially no tilling. I don't think I'm going to do it. I give up no tilling and cool, cool soil grain. I'll be able to come up with more grain soil. If the ground warm, it'll be just about that way. Like it'll come up yeah. in the road. It doesn't, it doesn't, uh, before I planned, I've not had good luck to it in, in any kind of cool weather. You know, early I've got to plant some in April and real good warm weather, I'll plant a sugar hill. Yeah, you know, it doesn't do good. That is, that's got to stay warm though. Mid, mid May, the early June. Yeah, I'll plant a plant. Well, it's mid May, and that's what the plant did. They suggest three quarters of an inch and inch and a quarter. And first of May, first of June. The often time to plant. So, uh, and I think, let's see, one of the research plots we did plant in the May, mid to end of May. Uh, we planted one of them, um, oh gosh, uh, the first of May, and I believe the one that we had the lodging issues with, and the one that got blown down, that one was the last one planted. <coughs> so, and, and uh, there may not have been a correlation there between the plant phase and the issues that we had. But right, it's a good possibility it had one season too. Yeah. But that one did, it, that later planted one was the one we did have the most issues with. Was it started the first Saturday one? Yes, yes. Yeah, all of the, the nitrogen trials, all of it got treated. There were only three strips of untreated because we had the nitrogen trial and then behind it we would do we did the fungicide trials. What what form of nitrogen did you use? In Irish pre-plant? McLean and Webster had pre-plant 
they all have an address and the uh, Hopkins County on the side address. Russ came back over here, you know, with the lady degree. Yes, so and that's so we adjusted those numbers in there for um, for that. Let's see. Okay, oh, y'all come back up. One pigeon controls. There we go. Um, with our nitrogen we had almost a nine bushel swing with pre axor versus non yes. And then with our nitrogen rates. We found that we could be used with no problem rate. Right? Once we got to 175, we started saying we have a lot of issues. So, and, and you know, there might it might not be 150 is the option. It might be 160 or 165. We just did 25 um, 25 unit increments. There was the far right was 100, 125. I think it's interesting. We got two more machines, uh, and then 150, 175, and we replicated all the jobs. So we're going to continue this study uh, for at least three four years. We're going to add. I'd rather shoot it too low, but we will compensate versus give it too big.